Hi everyone, I'm Mark Hamilton, and today um, I want to share with you one of the projects we've been working on as part of the AI for Earth program at Microsoft to kind of create a, a deep version of reality, to simulate reality to photorealistic detail. And we want to use this technology to help um, poacher recognition systems. So unfortunately, um, something that happened really recently was that an aerial survey done by Elephants Without Borders just a few weeks ago found basically a huge field of like 90 decapitated elephants. And this is a huge travesty when you think that these elephants like have feelings and emotions and familial units. And so this is really a, a very heinous crime. But when you actually take a look at this sort of thing, it's kind of depressingly easy for something like this to happen. The wildlife sanctuary where this occurred is called the Okavango Delta. And it's like, hundreds of thousands of square miles large. And it's territory that ranges from river deltas to kind of like sweeping plains to mountains and rivers. And so it's almost impossible for a team or a team of teams to ever possibly patrol this 24 seven. And if you drill into the economics of poaching, the picture gets even bleaker. You know, um, poaching is a $70 billion a year illegal industry. And the price for some of these things like rhino horn and elephant tusk is comparable to that of gold, except you don't you know, get a tiny flake of rhino horn, you get it in 20 to 40 pound chunks. And so if you do the math, you find out that if you are living in sub-Saharan Africa and you kill one elephant, that's effectively 50 to 100 years of income right there. So there's this huge financial incentive for people to actually go out there and then poach. And if you look on the other side of the picture, the people are actually trying to protect wildlife preserves. I mean, they're risking their lives for what's effectively a um, common good, this kind of good that doesn't really provide explicit financial incentives and is just needs to be funded by government organizations and things like that. So the economics are, are really out of whack. And for that reason, we want to try to partner with companies to help empower these rangers who are risking their lives every day to go out and be able to protect a lot more land than they otherwise could if they had to do it on foot or by car. And so we've partnered with the company Air Shepherd, and their basic mission is to take unmanned aerial vehicles or drones and equip them with infrared cameras and fly them autonomously above these kinds of wildlife preserves. And these cameras, they pick up on not only elephants, but also poachers and things like this. And they all beam back their data to centralized locations where people kind of monitor these 24 seven. And so now the, the challenge, instead of driving around, becomes just monitoring these cameras. And as you can imagine, this is like the worst TV channel ever. It's so boring. It's just god awful to watch this day in and day out 24 seven because nothing really happens all that much except for very small instances where you really need to be on top of your game to find these things. And furthermore, it's actually really hard to find poachers in these video feeds because they basically look like little tiny white heat dots in a sea of little tiny gray dots. So it's not very easy to do either. So Air Shepherd previously released a system called iSpy, which you know, is kind of uses conventional approaches like Gabor wavelets and histograms of oriented gradients and these kinds of things. But the result is that you have a system that has like 30 parameters that need to be really fine tuned. And if you don't fine tune it correctly, you get kind of what occurs on the left here, maybe on the right, okay, on the left. And, um, so this is basically, it just doesn't pick up on the things you're trying to find. But if you do fine tune it, it's, it's pretty good. But you know, the, as the drone is flying around different environments, the tunings change. And so it's actually really a manual process. So you know, it's kind of a, a, defeat, a defeating thing if you have this automated process that needs to be constantly manually tuned. It's not really that automated. So recently, we, we published a paper in collaboration with the University of Southern California that aim to kind of automate this process in a little bit more intelligent way using a deep network called Faster RCNN. And so um, Faster RCNN is a state-of-the-art um, object detection network. And today, we'll actually dive into a little bit about how it works from a deep learning perspective. It basically consists of a few chunks. Um, the first one is probably the easiest to understand. It takes your, your image which is an image is basically an array of pixels, like width by height by three for RGB. 
and it um, applies a series of convolutions and max pooling operations to basically take this image and squeeze it down into a, a, a thicker but smaller block of, of features, things that have um, kind of a lot more salient information present in them. Kind of condenses the information down into something that's more usable for algorithms. Next in the process is what's called the region proposal network. And this is where you're starting to, to have this network kind of look like an object detector. And so what the region proposal network does is that it takes a look at a bunch of different squares in this image called anchors. And so the idea is that you have an image and you place different kinds of potential candidate boxes all around this image. And these candidate boxes basically tile the whole image. It kind of looks like this over here. Oh, can you see? This over here. So we have uh, lots of different candidate boxes. And the first part of the algorithm takes a look at these candidate boxes and it says, which ones are worthy of investigation? Like, oh, this one might potentially have an object in it. We should drill down into those more. And it also spits out some numbers to tell how to adjust these boxes to fit the kinds of objects you're looking for. You know, if it's, it thinks that you're looking for an elephant, maybe it'll make it wider. If it thinks you're looking for a person, maybe it'll make it a little bit um, longer. So this is kind of the, the rough stage where it spits out lots of candidates for the next stage of the algorithm to check. And so the next stage of the algorithm consists of two parts, this region of interest pooling part. And what this basically does is take a variable size square of information, because these bounding boxes are different sizes, and it condenses them into a single size. So it just makes them a little bit easier to process downstream. And finally, we have the region-based convolutional network. And so what this does is it takes all of these proposed regions that have been featureized into a single length, and it says, OK, which, which ones do we want to call from the herd? Which ones actually contain the objects that we're thinking of? And then if it is, let's say, an elephant, how do we actually adjust the boxes? So it's kind of um, refining the process that was started earlier. And so what's nice about this is that this whole pipeline um, is differentiable end to end. And so that's important because when you're training deep networks, deep networks thrive on this notion of differentiability. It's how the information of your labels kind of flows all the way back to affect your, your first stages, the featureization stages. And so this network is nice because the entire thing is differentiable end to end. So it trains very quickly and it also is very accurate because every single piece of this can be honed in to best um, suit the task. And so what we find is that when we apply this kind of deep learning algorithm, we see marked results across the board in terms of precision, recall, and F1 for both animals and poachers. And we can even take this kind of network and we can throw it up and deploy it and make a real-time service that scales. And so for this initial work, what we used is Azure Kubernetes Service, which is a way to create Kubernetes clusters very easily. And we used TensorFlow Serving. And we made it um, horizontally auto-scale. So that means that when you have seven drones flying, the cluster will scale out to you know, be able to handle the images produced by seven drones. Where if you have no drones flying, the cluster will kind of collapse down and not cost anyone anything. So it's a more cost-effective solution when you have these very variable kinds of workloads. But throughout this process, you know, we need to take a step back and realize that we were pretty damn lucky. as data scientists and, re and researchers at Microsoft in that uh, we partnered with USC and AirSim, and they had spent six months of their time actually looking at all of this data and labeling it painstakingly. And so that's 40,000 frames of video that someone had to go through and draw tiny rectangles around all day in and day out. And so one of the goals that we had going further was how do we kind of democratize this process so that you don't need humans labeling this, that you don't need six months of time to create you know, uh, an incremental improvement in your deep learning system. And so what we decided to use going further was a, a simulation-based approach. And what we use is a technology called AirSim, which is an open source Microsoft tool that effectively lets you fly a drone around in suburban San Francisco almost. It's kind of like this computer generated map. So you get to fly a drone around in, in real time and control it. And what's nice about simulated data is that you have access to everything you could ever possibly want. You know the distance between the drone and every single piece of uh, 
object in the real world. You know exactly where objects start and end through real-time segmentation maps. And you even know like rotor speeds and all sorts of crazy information that you might not even use. And so what's nice about this is that you effectively have everything you could possibly need to, to train a deep learning algorithm right there in your simulation. Except for the fact that poachers don't usually hang out in suburban Southern California. And so the team at USC created an environment that actually, um, well, is the video going to play? No, of course not. So let me see if I can pull up the video here. But yeah, so the team made a, a copy of the African savanna. Let's see. Oh, I think it will play if I, there we go. Yeah, so effectively this drone will fly around this computer generated copy of the African savanna that we can fill with elephants and poachers. And it will be able to take real-time video of these computer-generated actors moving around. And we can generate, effectively, an infinite amount of data this way. So we can try different places, different configurations, different looks of elephants, different animals, different sizes and configurations of poachers. And we effectively get something that looks almost like reality. And we can make it look close to infrared by effectively taking the segmentation map and coloring it based on some heuristics for how hot things would be. So in this case, it's a, it might be a little bit hard to see here, but there's three tiny little white dots like hunting around in this African savanna. And so we can actually train the algorithm on this kind of rough approximation to infrared. And so what we find is that this, when you pair it with the real data that we have, dramatically improves the results. It kicks it up a notch. And so that was some really nice feedback that we have that we can kind of effectively get a little bit more out of our network without actually having to fly a drone around or without having to pay human labelers or things like this. But so if you notice in this chart that if we just use the simulated data, which is kind of represented by this column here, we actually do a lot worse than using the real data. We don't get a big bang for our buck when we just use this simulated data. And so we liken this to the fact that these infrared simulations, they don't look really like reality. I mean, they're close. They look um, fairly similar to infrared. They have the same rough characteristics, but it's not really the same kind of grainy, textured photos that you get from these drones. And so the next goal was to kind of close the gap between the simulated data that we have and the actual real data. And you know, I'm not an infrared camera engineer, so I don't know how to do this myself. And so we can learn a system to close this gap um, for us automatically. And so um, this brings us to this algorithm called the CycleGAN, which does some pretty mind-blowing things that are almost hard to believe, that are practically science fiction. And so what this algorithm does is, is called unpaired translation. And so what this means is it's almost like imagine an alien landed on this planet and they just started talking to you in their language. And if they talk to you long enough and you use this kind of algorithm, you can kind of start to decipher what they're saying, even though you have no paired words that effectively tell you how to translate. And so this algorithm is kind of the image version thereof of unpaired translation where you effectively have two data sets of images and you can learn to translate between them. So the canonical example that is often thrown around in the paper is a horse and zebra translator. So you can effectively feed this algorithm a big data set of horses and a big data set of zebras, and it will learn how to effectively translate your horses to zebras, something that you could only really think of in your mind's eye. And I want to make clear that this is very different from supervised learning. You know, you will never find in reality a horse that kind of turned zebra and posed in its exact same position for you to compare the pixels with. It's, it's fundamentally a different kind of loss function. And if you're interested, we can dive in a little bit. And the basic idea is that there's two components to this kind of algorithm. The first component is that you want for you want it to be consistent in some way. So when you translate from a horse to a zebra and back again, you want to get back your original horse. Likewise with zebras. If you translate from 
your, your zebra Bessie to, to a horse back to, to Bessie, you want to retain Bessie's character. And so it's this component paired with another component, which is effectively how believable your fake horses or zebras are. So what you have are two GANs, or two discriminator networks, that look at your fake horses and they say, is this a real horse or is this a fake horse? And you train the algorithm to trick this discriminator. And while you're training, the discriminator also learns how to distinguish your fake horses from your real horses. So these two kinds of networks, this horse translation system and this fake horse cop kind of compete against each other. And the result is that you converge to something that kind of keeps as much information as possible, but makes the result look as good as possible. And this is a very general thing. When you actually look at the architecture in terms of boxes and diagrams, there's no reference to horses or zebras there, and there's not even a reference to images there. So this kind of architecture can be applied to all sorts of different data types. You don't even need to have the same kind of data types on each side. And so some of the other things in the paper they do it is art style, summer, winter, night, day, all sorts of interesting things. But so what we'd like to do is we have a very similar situation where we effectively have a huge amount of this real drone footage that may or may not be labeled, it doesn't matter. And we have an unlimited amount of simulated data that we can generate through this open source tool, AirSim. And so we now want to learn a translation from the simulated tool to reality, in effect. And so, of course, this video won't play, so I'll just show it to you here. And so these are kind of the results that we find when we ran this, and we were really quite startled because they look just like the real data over here. And um, one thing that we had to do to actually improve the performance of this is if we fast forward, you'll see um, this is a little elephant walking across. And because the elephants are so small in this original image, the, the network doesn't really attune to them. So we just um, go in there and manually highlight them up to, to bring it up to what it would kind of look like in reality. But What's kind of nice is that, you know, I don't know how to make a photorealistic infrared simulation. This is just learned automatically from the data we have available. And what we're now working on is that it's great to do this for infrared, but we also want to kind of expand this to, to be able to um, help a lot more industries and applications. And so just like with this where we have a large data set of video game footage and real f and uh, infrared footage, we'd like to swap out that infrared footage with really high definition like 4K video to effectively make a full reality simulator that can then be used to improve um, you know, simulated data for driverless cars or, or autopilots or things like this. And so that's our, our next work that we're kind of um, targeting with this. And so, to actually train this kind of a network, um, unfortunately, it takes like a week plus to make a reality simulator because this algorithm is just very resource intensive. GANs are, are not the easiest things to train because they involve um, this kind of alternating kind of training, and they're also not incredibly stable, even with advancements like the, the W GAN or the Wasserstein GAN, it still takes a long time. And when you're dealing with images, they're really big, so you can't fit a lot of them into your GPUs. So we've targeted um, Horavad, this kind of distributed deep learning framework to do this. And so our first um, kind of attempt at this was using, again, Azure Kubernetes service and just spinning up Horavad on this. And so we can spin up a, a pod of Horavad. We can connect them all with an Azure file mount that we mount into our Kubernetes cluster. And we can write the logs out to that Azure file mount and read them up with TensorBoard so we can get some live feedback on how our model is doing and things like this. And in this work, we've tried to make this as simple as possible. So we've used a tool called Helm, which is effectively a package manager for these kinds of distributed applications. And so um, we'll be publishing this Helm chart very soon. And effectively, you'll just be able to say, Helm install Poacher CycleGAN, and boom, it'll just deploy all this crazy stuff into your Kubernetes cluster um, without you really having to think all that much about what's going on under the hood. But throughout this process, we've faced a lot of challenges. And a lot of these challenges come from the fact that we're not using Spark. Um, you know, one of the key things is that we don't really have unified procedures for storing data. I mean, this is an academic collaboration, and so you can guess like how crazy the data is. It's just like wherever people pulled it from. 
And our serving and training architectures, although both in Kubernetes, are kind of fundamentally different. You know, one is using TensorFlow serving, and the other one is using Horovod. So they don't have the same APIs. They don't have the same architecture, so we have to spin up a whole different collection of pods in order to do this. And that means there's no like single entry point. You know, I can't show you a nice, beautiful demo where I click through notebook cells and everything happens. I have to like actually install architectures and do complicated things. And so in our next phase of this work, we really want to simplify this to make this as quick and easy as possible so that we can do more things like this without having to spend a year working on it. And so what we are targeting with this kind of next refactor of the code is SparkML because it's a high-level language for distributed machine learning. And um, if you've used um, scikit-learn before, it's like scikit-learn, but way better, because they actually thought about their abstractions. Um, and what's nice also is that all models have a uniform API. So you can kind of take pieces of machine learning and swap them out with other pieces. So it makes it very easy to kind of upgrade to a more complex model when you feel it's right. You can just take your simple model, swap it out with a more complicated one. And in this vein, um, Databricks, I think uh, last Spark Summit, released Horovod on Spark as part of their ML runtime. And so what this does is it unifies Horovod, the distributed training thing that you know can take your whatever TensorFlow code you have and distribute it efficiently across a large cluster of machines and it injects it into the Spark ML library. And it uses um, a project called Project Hydrogen um, that Reynolds, Zinn, and others worked on that effectively bypasses the standard Spark scheduling mechanism so that you can effectively do whatever you want with your distributed cluster for a time and then go back to the regular Spark execution model. And so that's what's kind of going on under the hood with Horovod on Spark, and this is something that we're working on to hook into. So to take this existing Horovod workflow and just move it onto Horovod on Spark so it has this nice SparkML API and it's very easy to set up and combine. And so now the question is, so we've figured out this, this path to move our current deep learning training workload into the SparkML framework, and now what about our serving workload? And so for that, we uh, at Microsoft is introducing a new Spark serving framework that enables you to spin up web services on any Spark cluster, including Databricks or, or what have you. And this framework allows you to basically um, create distributed web service with sub-millisecond latencies because it's built on Spark's continuous streaming engine. And so what that also means is that it's the same API as batch and streaming. You don't need to change your code to be able to hook into it. And um, our library that kind of encapsulates this is called MML Spark, and everything in our library is available in Scala, Python, R, and um, Java. So you can use it wherever you are comfortable working in Spark. And again, it's fully open source, and this morning in the keynote, we've announced that we're contributing this back to Spark Core, and hopefully we can make it in for the next version of Spark. And so if we want to take a look at some of the APIs, um, they look a little bit like this, where Instead of kind of reading a, a data frame from a file, like spark.read.csv, you just have to change that um, reading code. So spark.read becomes spark.readStream because it's built on Spark Streaming. And our streaming source is a server. And we can configure the server, give it a host, a port, an API name. We can uh, parse a request. So in this case, we want to um, only take requests that have a nice binary type payload. And then we want to call these the bytes of our image. And we can then pass them into our SparkML model, modify this with any Spark SQL operations that we please, and finally write it back out to the server. And so the basic idea is that serving and streaming are not really separate. That serving is just streaming where you, your source and your sync are the same thing, namely a web request. And so that's kind of what powers this, is that when you write back to the same service that you came from, you're effectively logically responding to the request. And so that's kind of what the code looks like to take any kind of model or Spark computation and turn it into a distributed web service backed by your cluster. And so the architecture for this that we've, we've built is that Spark Serving automatically spins up service, servers on each of your workers. And we have three modes. We have standard server mode, which spins one up on the head node and then internally distributes, so you don't have to worry about load balances or anything like this. We have our old version distributed server, which is one server per executor. 
And then you can put your own load balancer on top of that to, in order to parallel, in order to actually get to all these different services. And then our new piece that we've announced um, in our previous, in our recent release of MML Spark is called Continuous Server. And this is what builds on Spark's continuous mode to drive the latency down by a factor of 100 to be sub millisecond. And so this kind of brings us to our ideal architecture, where we just have every single thing in Spark, and we host that Spark orchestration engine, either on Kubernetes or on Azure Databricks. It doesn't really matter all that much. But the idea is that we want to take in our data. We want to do the data processing on Spark to kind of leverage that huge parallelism. And we also have an integration with OpenCV. We've released that a few years ago. So we can kind of leverage that to pre-process our images, get them ready for the algorithm. We want to be able to train the entire cycle again with Horovod on Spark. We want to be able to train the object detector that then uses the data that CycleGAN spits out again with Horovod on Spark. And then finally, we want to take that object detector that has been so long in the making, and we want to just deploy this as a distributed web service with Spark serving so that we kind of leverage the same architecture throughout the entire piece, and it will be nice and simple and hopefully a quick notebook to look at. And so in conclusion, we have um, this kind of um, round of conferences, we've released the sub-millisecond latency distributed web services, and we also have two more large announcements in our next session. Um, and we aim to give all of this work back to the community, so Spark Serving and the other work that we've done will all be open source. And you can also get started with our library that we've used to build a lot of these pieces. Um, with, uh, we have a 16 Jupyter Notebook data science course that you can find at aka.ms slash spark. And so thank you all for listening, and thanks to the team who helped create this, so the MML Spark team, the Microsoft AI Development Acceleration Program, and uh, the University of Southern California for really um, collaborating with us. Elizabeth Bondi was the person who really did a huge amount of work on this project, and so I owe her a great deal. Yeah, thank you very much, and feel free to get in touch or check out our website. We have any questions? Time for like one. Oh, all right. Uh, hi. Uh, we didn't see the results after you applied the GAN to the. Oh to yeah. The, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, the the unfortunate thing is like we just got these results, so we're like currently turning the crank on that. But hopefully we'll see a nice marked improvement. So next Spark Summit, you'll see something. Any other? Questions? Don't be shy. All right. Then let's thank Mark again. <laughs> <laughs>